next time I see a cop with his gun drawn and he's grabbing an innocent, unarmed black citizen, and then he pumps that citizen with seven bullets into his back at point-blank range, while his three little children, three, five, and eight years old, watch their daddy being executed from the back seat of the car. If I were a, a witness to this, let me just ask you, don't I have a legal and moral obligation to, say, blow his motherfucking head off? I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm not violent. But what if the cop was killing your daughter right there in front of your eyes? I'm a pacifist. Yeah, so don't don't take this the wrong way. I'm, I'm just asking for a friend. My podcast here was created by me using the Anchor app. Anchor is the free podcast platform that allows me and you and anyone to set up and start their own podcast free of charge so that your voice is heard. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you. Again, free of charge. So you can be on Spotify, you can be on Apple Podcasts, many more. Now, why are they doing this? And why have they done this for me since my very first podcast in, in December? Simply, it's because they believe in the democratization of audio, pure and simple. And because of that, that's why I use this platform. Don't forget, it's free and it's easy to use. And I encourage you to download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm and get started. I can't tell you how many people I've heard from, from you. People listening to this podcast who have gone on to create their own podcast. I'm so happy to hear this. Now more than ever, our voices need to be heard. Welcome back to Rumble. This is Michael Moore, and thank you for joining me on my episode today. On today's episode, well, there's a lot going on this week. Obviously, the Republican convention has been happening, but there's really nothing happening there other than Melania Trump somehow got permission to tear up the Rose Garden and create a whole new Rose Garden. And it's, I, I, I'll see if I can find some pictures here to put up on the, on the site here. The before and after. The before Rose Garden contained a rose planted by every first lady since 1913. And it had these two beautiful crabapple trees with their beautiful blossoms that were planted by Jackie Kennedy. Melania had Jackie's trees ripped out of there, ripped out every single one of the roses from every first lady since 1913 and planted it with some, you know, I was going to make some Slovenian joke here, but I've been to Slovenia. It's a beautiful country. It's an Alpine country. The Alps are there. It's nobody knows that about Slovenia, but it's just a beautiful place. And this looks like some, you know, garden of the gulag 1951. Um, it's just completely ruined. And today they finally, after her speech on, uh, on Tuesday night, her Republican convention speech in the Rose Garden, they admitted that they destroyed the trees and all the roses in the whole garden be so they could get, the cameras could get a better shot of Melania at the podium giving her speech. And then when she walks away with Trump, they needed to walk down that long, that long, I don't know what it is, deck thing that's on the Rose Garden. It's attached to the White House. And the camera wouldn't have been able to get her, essentially her runway walk to go back into the White House. And so they destroyed the Rose Garden for the shot. Now, I know, you, Mike, there's a lot going on this week. Uh, why are you upset about this? I'm not upset about it. I'm just saying it's... Well, I don't need to say why. I don't need to actually explain the symbolism of what that is and what it meant. It's the final weeks, my friends, of the destruction of our country, the destruction of our democracy. It's coming to an end, hopefully. But we're not even there yet. And instead, the country continues to be destroyed in other ways. 
And in this case, this past Sunday in broad daylight, the police in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and one police officer in particular pulled his gun on a black man, unarmed, an unarmed, innocent black man who we don't have the whole story yet, but apparently there were these two women that were fighting. He had stopped the car, then he was trying to break up the fight. It's kind of a, essentially a, I don't know, good Samaritan. Maybe they were fighting over him. I don't know. We'll know this eventually. Here's how little we know. Five days later, they finally, yesterday, released the name of the cop, Rustin Chesky. That's his name. Rustin, as in Rusty. Rusty. Hey, Rusty. Rusty Chesky. You've seen the video. Jacob Blake wanted to get back in his car. His three kids are in there. They're, th- they're three, five, and eight years old. He opens the door of the driver's seat. He's not, he's not putting up any kind of fight. He doesn't have a weapon. He starts to get into his car. The cop grabs him from behind by the T-shirt, holds him in place, and then fires seven bullets into his back at point-blank range while the children are in the back seat watching this. That cop, Chesky, Rusty, Rusty Chesky, has not been arrested. No charges have been filed. If a black guy had pulled the shirt of a white guy, or say the shirt of a white cop, and put seven bullets in his back, do you think it'd go five days before you found out the name of the, the guy and before he would be arrested? How long do you think it would take a black guy to get arrested in the United States of America for putting seven bullets in the back of somebody else, a white guy, a cop? Yeah, okay, I know. Mike, don't ask questions that you know the answers to. Uh, My friends, you, I'm sure, like me, have gone through these five days after watching that video. You can't get the video out of your head. And now, miraculously, Jacob Blake, the victim, is not dead. But he is, as they say now, he is permanently paralyzed from the waist down. Wow. And this cop is home. This cop walks free. Wow. Wow. It doesn't stop, does it? And you know what? It's not going to stop. It's not going to stop until we stop it. It will not stop itself. Defund, disarm, demilitarize, and dismiss all racist, gun-loving cops. (sighs) I don't know. You know, I've, I've got my defense fund I've put up. We, we had a goal of 50,000. We're I literally today we are at 49,000 that we've raised. So we're just a thousand away, which means, um, sometime in the next few days, we are going to provide this money to the National Lawyers Guild and to some other branches like in Portland and, and elsewhere. So they have the money to help protesters who are being arrested while they're protesting either to provide bail or to provide legal help or to whatever whatever is needed to fight the cops and the DAs, these attorney generals, the ones who are too weak to do what needs to be done, to help the movement so that there's justice, so that, so that we are going to completely dismantle the way we do police work in this country and rebuild it into something that is about true peacekeeping. And we can do that. And create a system to where the people that are in need of help can get help. You don't need to call a man with a badge and a gun when somebody has a drug problem, an alcohol problem, a mental health problem. But right now, right now, everybody's had it. I've had it. You've had it. And I thought we'd begin today by going directly to the streets of Kenosha, Wisconsin. Scene of the crime scene of the continuing uprising that has been taking place across this country. And my guest uh, from Kenosha uh, is uh, Malika Jabali. Uh, She is an attorney. She's an activist, a writer. You may have read her uh, in uh, Current Affairs, one of my favorite magazines, uh, The Intercept, uh, The Guardian. She um, she actually wrote an excellent piece uh, for Current Affairs uh, called The Color of Economic Anxiety. Uh, it's about race and, and class in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, after after uh, Malika wrote that, she decided to do a, a, a short film, short doc, 
called Left Out. And I'll put a link to that here on my podcast site. Um, uh, you can watch it. Anybody can watch it on YouTube. Left Out, this short doc, uh, again, takes uh, Malika to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, to focus on the uh, black Midwestern working class, which often gets erased. I can tell you that from personal experience in Flint, uh, Michigan, from Detroit. Erased and ignored by the mainstream media. Malika is currently, right now, speaking, we're going to speak to her from uh, Kenosha. And she's there reporting, not just on the aftermath of the police shooting of Jacob Blake and the shootings that took place last night on the Tuesday night, uh, but also on the underlying issues that led not only to this shooting, but to the rebellion that is now taking place. Welcome, Malika, to Rumble. Hi, Michael. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, can you just give us a, a brief uh, update on that? We're, we're recording this in the PM of Wednesday. Uh, 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 we post these podcasts usually uh, uh, around uh, midnight. Uh, so this will be up later tonight to those who are listening. Just uh, if you could give us a little background from your perspective of what happened, um, the context of it happening, and also what happened on last night on Tuesday night with the shootings of protesters uh, that took place. The community out here in, in Kenosha, the black community is about 10% of the city. It is 30 minutes outside of Milwaukee, essentially a suburb of Milwaukee, about an hour north of Chicago. And you could imagine that it is a place where you had white flight from segregated communities in Milwaukee and Chicago and Kenosha. Given the fact that it is, you know, so um, has relatively few people of color relative to the cities near to it, built on a kind of this idea that, you know, this is our space and other folks coming into it are outsiders and that could probably explain, this is just me kind of analyzing the situation here, why there were some issues with the Kenosha Police Department. Um, about 15 years ago, there have been ongoing issues with police, policing and incarceration in Wisconsin in general. And so when Jacob Blake, uh, when a police officer shot him in the back as he reached inside his car, likely to protect his children who were in the car. When he was shot and we saw this, people, uh, black people witnessed this in the neighborhood and the neighborhood where he was, where he was shot, you know, there are a number of black residents who are, are nearby. Uh, it was a response to years of decades, really, of oppressive conditions that black people have been experiencing really throughout the Midwest specifically in Wisconsin and particularly in Milwaukee. Milwaukee has the highest black male incarceration rate in the country. Milwaukee has, and I'm talking about Milwaukee just because it's just 30 minutes outside of Kenosha. And there's a lot of kind of interplay between folks who work in Kenosha and, and live in Milwaukee and vice versa. If you talk to the people who are coming out right. uh, to the protests. They have the highest black male incarceration rate. Actually, the whole state does. Uh, the state of, of Wisconsin has the highest unemployment or re really jobless rate for black men in the country who are in their like prime you know, working years. And they are also dying at eight times the rate of white people from COVID, which is also the highest in the country. So arguably, Wisconsin is the worst place to live for black Americans and it competes with Minnesota in these different indicators. So usually those are, you know, one and two, they kind of jockey for a position depending on the year and, and the outcomes. So the folks who are coming down here, when you walk with them and you listen to them and you march with them, you know, it's, it's folks from Minnesota who kind of see themselves in this, community, folks from Minnesota, folks from uh, Chicago, and they're all, you know, relatively close by. Philando Castile's girlfriend, actually, she was one of the people marching and, and uh, rallying just yesterday 
who was trying to uh, raise awareness of the issues that people are going through. And if, if y'all remember, Philando Castile was shot by a police officer where, while his kids were also in the back. A very similar dynamic here. And she was confronting armed vigilantes. So imagine she has to travel miles away from Minnesota, already dealing with her own tragedy, to comfort and strengthen and fortify other people who are dealing with a very imminent tragedy to confront people who want to kill them for the sake of protecting poverty, uh, property. So it's a confluence of factors that are happening here and it's very sobering to witness. What, what happened with the shooting of protesters? The park has been, that's been sort of ground zero for protests against the police officers, against the, the courthouse. And by around 1030 or so, the police kind of back the protesters out of the park and into Sheridan Road. And Sheridan Road is a very long um, stretch of, of, you know, of a main artery through the city where they barricaded it on, on either side. And it's also, it fronts the courthouse, it fronts a lot of government buildings. So they back the protesters onto Sheridan Road and were throwing tear gas. You could hear the, um, these like concussion grenades, a lot, a lot of noise, tear gas that was like filtering up into the room that I was in. My, my lips, I could still feel the, you know, the tingling from the tear gas coming onto me, um, that, you know, approaching me and further down the road while they are accosting these uh, the protesters and telling them to go home and throwing tear gas at them further down the road you could hear gunshots i heard it from where i was they rang into the air and i found out when i woke up exactly what happened so they pretty much backed the protesters out about seven blocks up from where I am or six blocks up from where I am, uh, that's when this armed vigilante who people knew they were coming, they were at the park, they were very visible, they were open carrying all afternoon. Protesters were trying to de-escalate, or leaders of the protests were trying to de-escalate with them all day, all evening rather. Um, and from just piecing together various footage. These are white people we're talking about. What? These are white vigilantes. White yeah. vigilantes. We don't know if they're white supremacists or whatever, but right. uh, these are white men, essentially, with guns. Yes. Who have shown up. Yes. But from the footage that they've pieced together, you can see there was like an earlier quote unquote confrontation where apparently one of the armed white men threw, uh, not threw, but he aimed a gun at somebody else, one of the protesters protesters aimed a gun at uh, a white protester who was like protesting alongside the other BLM protesters. And apparently he's the one who the killer Kyle Rittenhouse, the ch he shot one protester in the head. He shot another in the chest and he shot someone else where it grazed their arm. The person who was shot in the arm, people are saying, well, he had a gun, like this was self-defense. Well, he actually was alive. The two that he killed, from the looks of things, they weren't armed. So the self-defense claim really should be for the protesters who, in the footage that is most widely distributed, they were running after him because he had just shot one of their friends. He shot one of their friends in the head. They run after him uh, to try and, you know, probably disarm him. And he continues to shoot more. He didn't just shoot at the people who were in front of him. He shot into the crowd multiple times. So that's likely where the other person was shot in the chest and died. He calm, like he runs away. But once he see the, sees the police officers, he's walking calmly towards them in the video. And instead of them apprehending him, you know, I'm still feeling the effects of the tear gas that they threw. They're coming at him with these armored trucks and do nothing. Not only did they do nothing, they told him to get to the side and get out of the street so that they could drive by towards where the protesters were. Wow. So this is how backwards and depraved the system is. And if you look at other footage, you know, Twitter investigators have to be on the job because apparently our mainstream media uh, doesn't want to do kind of the same work, the investigative work of this. 
if you look at previous video, just a minute before that, the same police department was thanking him and other armed white men for their service. And in the background, you can hear, hear them telling the protesters to go home. So they literally, they say, thank you so much, guys. Do you mm. want some water? Wow. So he's hydrated to kill people and run away. I guess he, he needed all that hydration so he could get back to Illinois safely where he's from. And he was apprehended by police in Illinois, but not by the Kenosha Police Department. Oh, when he was apprehended by the police in Illinois, then they must have got their guns out and started firing away. Right. Right. Like right. they did to Mr. Blake. Right. And, there and, you they, go. And, they, and they shot little Kyle. They shot probably shot him dead. Right. There you go. No, no not right. Right. So he's um, alive. Yeah, oh, yeah, of course. Kyle Rittenhouse is alive. The killer is alive and unharmed, untouched. From what I heard, he turned himself in. Yeah. So he had to turn himself in. Correct. To the police instead of them finding him. Um, so he just glides on by the, the same police department who thanked them for their their work, handed them water. And you can see him on, on the video, you know, chummy chummy going over to all the armored vehicles trying to grab the water. Um, and then he proceeds to mm. go back to his, his friends to, to protect, uh, an empty car dealership is what it looks like because in apparently a, that's yeah. more important. In a very bizarre press conference, uh, earlier today here on Wednesday, uh, it was either the sheriff or the police chief in Kenosha stood in front of the microphone and was asked about, uh, did he want to encourage other people to show up in Kenosha with guns to help the police uh, maintain law and order? And his answer was, well, you know, if they if they do that, then, you know, I can deputize them, but then they're going to have to obey our rules. And the Constitution of Wisconsin says that they'll have to follow you know, the way we want to do it. Whereas if they don't, if they're not deputized, you know, if we don't encourage them to come, but they, you know, come on their own, uh, the implication was they can just show up and do what they want then. They won't be under the auspices of the Kenosha Police or Sheriff's Department. It was really frightening to hear. And then he just kind of snickers. Um, okay. they, they, he, he, had, he had gone, I don't know, so far into this press conference with no discussion about who put seven bullets into the back of Mr. Blake. No, no discussion of that. No, no discussion of Kyle, of what's happening to Kyle. Nobody's being arrested. It's just, it is disgusting. This is the, this is the congressional district that Paul Ryan uh, used to represent. Um, I know it just from, you know, being from Flint, uh, the both Kenosha and Racine, um, which are, you know, south of um, uh, Milwaukee, are, are factory towns. The big three auto companies have made fac uh, cars there, have made for years, decades. Um, so it's a very working class uh, area. And um, it's just, it has been so uh, bothersome. But now you're there. And um, just before we actually just started Recording it, uh, the NBA game that was supposed to start at 4 p.m. between the Milwaukee uh, Bucks and the Orlando Magic, uh, the Orlando the Milwaukee Bucks walked off and boycott boycotted the game, forfeited the game when they're in the middle of the, their playoffs. Uh, uh, you, you to forfeit? I mean, they couldn't take it. They would, would didn't want to participate. Now I got to tell you, I've heard from other NBA players in the last few days, they don't want to be there now. In Orlando, they don't want to be playing basketball. They've had it. LeBron's had it. Um, it was stunning to see this just just before we started here. And I know you know it's basketball, it's sports, whatever. But I'm telling you that the NBA and the NBA players have led the way, and they have been they have been at the forefront of this with Black Lives Matter and everything that's been going on. You know, so you're so now you're there. Um, nightfall is. I don't know, um, three hours away, maybe. Um, yeah. What is, what's the mood and what are people talking about doing? What is the movement uh, planning uh, to do tonight? Because, you know, we've had these protests um, by the hundreds of thousands. If you combine it all in the, since May 25th by the millions, um, 
And we so far have, have it's not that, that people have, you know, there have been maybe a half dozen incidents of white supremacist shooting and, and killing, uh, uh, usually um, African-Americans, but, um, but it hasn't been a thing, if you know what I'm saying. It, uh, in fact, in Portland, which has been, which has been the, the place that's really heated up in the last uh, month or so, even though they've been doing it since May too, uh, even there, there hasn't been this kind of white violence um, against uh, protesters. So, you know, I'm just now speaking as an individual and a human being uh, that I am worried about you and everybody else there tonight uh, in Kenosha. Um, and, you know, I'm not saying back off one inch, but um, what is the plan here so that uh, voices can be heard, demands can be made of the prosecutor and of the police department, um, but, but, but nobody gets killed. Right. And I, and I realize I can't do much about that because I'm, I'm, I'm essentially asking the white supremacists who are not listening to this <laughs> to not kill anybody. So, so what is the plan to protect our people, our lives, the protest movement, et cetera? Right. It's going to be hard to tell, I think, until maybe a little bit later in the evening. The typical agenda has been there's some sort of march a few hours um, or hour or so before a nightfall. And it ends at this park that is uh, about a block away from me. I'm moving. Uh, so I could just see, and there's usually a rally there in the very late afternoon, early morning. I don't see anyone gathered there this morning. So, um, or this afternoon rather. So I, it's hard. It's really hard, hard to tell because I think at this point, it, this kind of violence radicalizes people more. It kind of does the opposite effect of what, um, politicians or some advocates may think or or want or the vigilantes may want but I can't see this group backing down necessarily from this I think and and by, by not backing down I mean I think they're going to continue to demonstrate continue to protest because they had lines you know hundreds of police officers and armored trucks and they got threatened multiple times from the uh the PA system that was coming out of the, the, you know, the speaker that was coming out of these armored vehicles last night that, you know, you have to disperse, you have to go home. And even though they pushed them out of the park, they continue to, to protest as it is their right to do when somebody gets shot in the back seven or, or eight times without any sort of repercussion, um, any sort of discipline or consequences for the officer. So I don't see them backing down from that. I got here Monday morning. And so after I heard about the protest Sunday night, so they've been going strong for the past three or four days. And I can't imagine it really slowing down from there. But unfortunately, um, they have been left with no, no choice, really, because most of the, the vast majority of, of these protesters are not armed with, with guns at all. You know, they're marching peacefully through the street. They're finding whatever they can, you know, it reminds, it reminds me of the Gaza Strip uh, in Palestine where they're, you know, throwing rocks at a courthouse. They're throwing bottles, whatever they can find. Uh, they aren't coming here with this idea of initiating violence, but people have a right to self-defense. We all know the facts. We all know what happened. We all saw the video. We all have eyes. Um, so it, um, um, and I think we're all, deeply affected by it on some sort of level. But um, I think, and why I wanted to talk to you today is because I know that you've been there a number of times in Wisconsin, you've written about it, you've made a short film about it, and, um, and that you could help us provide some context to this. So, so provide the context. How, how, do, how do these white officers, they're there less than three minutes when they come to what apparently uh, Blake was uh, trying to break up a, a fight between um, two women and uh, pulled over. He had his kids in the back seat. 
uh, the police show up. Nobody really bothers to figure out what happened. Nobody bothers to ask maybe that Jacob Blake might have been uh, acting as a good Samaritan. No, none of that. He's black. Um, he wants nothing to do with them. He's worried about his kids. He goes back to open his car door, and then we see what happens. Uh, how do fellow human beings bring themselves to he, the, the cop who did it, grabbed him by his T-shirt so he couldn't move? held him with one hand, put the gun to his back, and fired seven bullets with the other hand. That just doesn't happen by accident. That kind of incident doesn't just fall out of the sky. That There's something behind that. There's something in our American, our American way that allows that to happen on Sunday and allows it to happen over and over and over and over and over again. And um, yes, everyone is fed up with it. And yes, we have got to stop this now. I don't want a commission. I don't want any of this shit. I want this stopped. But but I also know that it operates out of a greater context of, of, of what we've allowed to happen in terms of where we put our poor people, where, where the racial lines that we draw, the Flint, Michigans, the Kenosha, Wisconsin's, the East St. Louis, Illinois, the Gary, Indiana's, Watts and Philly and every place else. Um, just speak to that because I think that's, that's personally what I wanted to hear from you. And, and uh, uh, the other, the facts and everything else, we, we know we, we, it's going to be gone over and over and over again. But what is not getting discussed on the cable news channels, on the networks, uh, just about any place else is there's a, we got the who, we got the what, we got the where, we got the when, and we got the how. The five, the six questions of journalism, but we don't have the why. So fill that big blank in for us, Malika. Yeah, I think the um, the primary thing we can think about, the more obvious one is the persistence of white supremacy in policing and incarceration in Wisconsin for decades, uh, I would actually say probably a century of policing in Wisconsin, uh, in Milwaukee at least, there have been um, very reactionary ranks from the top down, from the uh, police chiefs of the city who allowed these quote unquote justifiable homicides to explain the killing of black men. This is as far back as the 40s and, and 1950s, when black people were first migrating into the, the region from the deep south, you know, they're trying to escape this racial caste system in the south and come to the racial terrorism of northern uh, towns that were still very segregated. So there is that history of racial, very, you know, radical terrorism coming from police departments. and. 1968, or actually 1967, there was, there was a, another large uprising in Milwaukee because people were protesting the, the housing conditions. It was a very segregated town then, it's a very segregated town now. And through their protesting, police officers surveilled, these was like the NAACP, they would surveil them relentlessly and threaten their lives. And so this is out in the open, they called them the goon squad. It was sanctioned, it was welcome. Uh, they did that to terrorize black people for simply arguing for their rights to have fair housing. The same way that they are arguing for their rights to just have their lives matter. The same kind of uh, malice and recklessness and uh, lack of any sort of, of humanity for these families is deeply embedded in certain white supremacist factions within the police departments in the Milwaukee area, including in Kenosha. So that kind of police terrorism allows for Wisconsin, again, to have the highest incarceration rate for black men in the country. And it's been like that for quite a while now. For a, a state that only has 10% black men, like that is the life that they have to endure on a regular basis. 
And, but underlying that, you also have a economic system. You have a capitalist system where corporations were encouraged to, de, uh, to go offshore, de-industrialize a lot of these towns, as you mentioned before. But instead of replacing this with any sort of adequate jobs policy, both Democrats and Republicans just, you know, signed NAFTA. They allow the corporations to, to go elsewhere. They move to the suburbs. They move out to, you know, places like Kenosha or northern parts of Milwaukee. And they don't replace the jobs with anything else but prisons. So instead of factories, now you've right. got right. a high incarceration rate, which means that you've got black men who have the highest unemployment gap or, or black people have the highest unemployment gap between blacks and whites in uh, Wisconsin than anywhere else in the country. So there's the highest disparity in employment for all rate for all, you know, both black men and women, the highest uh, gap in unemployment for black men in their prime working years. So it's the highest, it's the highest gap but they also have like the, the lowest unemployment rate uh, right. or, or joblessness rate as well. You know, so you have all of these kind of economic things that are stirring in the pot. You're not giving them any other yeah. opportunity. You throw them in jail and people are angry. People are rightly angry. They're dying more from COVID. No, there's yeah. no accountability yeah. from either side. And this is under a, a state with a, a democratic governor. I believe Kenosha has a Democratic mayor. Um, I think Milwaukee also has a Democratic mayor as well. So who's doing, which policymakers are actually doing anything to make sure that Black lives actually matter and they don't just tweet it out? Hmm. So what can the people who are listening to this, what can they do? What should they do right now, today, tonight? Um, you know, some people live nearby. If you are in Minnesota, Illinois, Michigan. Um, others don't. Um, people want to be involved right now. They want to help. They want to add their voices to the growing chorus. Um, you know, and I'm at, and this is the non-journalist part of you. I'm asking you as a person who's also been an activist and, and a citizen, which actually being a citizen in a democracy should just you shouldn't have to say activist because it implies you, if the citizenry is not active. We don't have a democracy. So, so what can, what can people listen to this do? If you are in the Milwaukee area, I think the community here needs um, physical support. I think just showing that there is a, uh, concern and empathy for people who just want to see some something happen to the police officer. Physical support, I think, is helpful. Uh, I have not seen protesters really get arrested. You know, in a lot of other cities, they, they've got bail funds and things like that. Um, but there are some organizations, uh, I, I believe it's like uh, Milwaukee Freedom Fighters, they're doing some organizing here go to Facebook and follow people like Vaughn Mays or um, Angela Lang, who are doing organizing in the Milwaukee area and are trying to support people out here. Call the, I could give you some links, but there are a number of links that people have shared and telephone numbers to call the Kenosha Police Department, given again their seeming complicity with these white terrorists to just inflict violence on people. Uh, I don't know how helpful that's going to be, but I think they, they need to have their, their telephone lines flooded and their emails flooded, uh, continue to put pressure on them, C continue to put pressure on the governor right now, who's apparently listening to Donald Trump's orders to bring the National Guard in today. So contact these elected officials and make them accountable. Apparently, only one uh, I was at a rally and only one elected official came out, at least according to one of the, the speakers at the rally. He said, this is our only elected official to come out to this. Hmm. So there needs to be some more support for people who are not asking for a lot. They are really asking for the very basic thing. Do not kill me if I've given you absolutely no reason to do so. No real reason to do so. Right. What a what a awful request to make. 
you know, please just, please don't kill me. I want to, you know, I want to just remind people too that um, I've set up a legal defense fund for protesters and others who are involved in this uprising so that they, whether they need bail money or whether they need legal help or whatever it is. And I've been working closely uh, with the Lawyers Guild. Um, and um, I think the, probably the bulk of this money is will go directly to them because I think they're the best in terms of making sure every dime is spent the right way and, uh, and helping people. You're familiar with them, I'm sure, um, Malika. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so if people want to give to that, it's still here on my, on my uh, podcast uh, site. I think, um, and this is something that I, I think about through my organizing work because it is a seemingly insurmountable problem, you know, with you talking about your experiences, seeing this, these same issues as a child, as someone who studies history, I've seen it historically for decades and centuries. And the question is, essentially, how do you get rid of a white supremacist capitalist system that in every fiber of its being oppresses people, primarily black people, uh, through this racial hierarchy? We, d I don't know. I really, I can't, pretend like I know the answer or what answers will work because I'm st we're still experimenting, you know, as, as people who do any sort of activist work. I will say that at least part of, part of it is focusing on policy and, you know, less on trying to change people's minds right. because that will take a lot of undoing. That is that can be entrenched from what you were raised with, with yeah. your families, with, you know, your parents and what your parents yeah. were taught, you know, it's inherited, you know, we, it's yeah, we, like don't, we don't have time to change that. I, I'd rather, I'd rather go with the fact that I think the majority of humans, majority of people do have a conscience, do know right from wrong and are on our side in some form that, that it's only a percentage that is though large even if it's just 20%, that means it's 60 million plus Americans that have these attitudes. That's a lot. Right, right. It's a lot of scary people, a lot of guns. Right. You know, and we're talking about kind of different levels of oppression. There's one where it's very explicit white supremacist violence. Uh, I think that is going to be difficult to figure out. And, you know, people are operating in these underground channels in a way and complicit with the police officers who give them cover. There is another form of, of oppression and violence, for instance, like I mentioned with the COVID disparities built on years of institutional and systemic racism and, and capitalism. And I think those kinds of things come from folks who might be uh, well-meaning, saying that they are willing to share in America's wealth. You know, you have a piece of, a, of the American pie. Our culture is very individualistic. So it is going to require a bit of a cultural shift to be able to say, okay, well, you know, I know I've got my home in, in the suburbs that Donald Trump wants me to hold on to, but can I vote for this uh, transit tax so that other people can get around to access the jobs that we've been able to hoard for ourselves? Will I support a candidate who's fighting for Medicare for all? Uh, because so many black people are dying disproportionately from a lot of these health outcomes. Will I be willing to live in other neighborhoods or willing to share my schools with other people so that they can also get the same kind of education that I've been able to receive because of, you know, inherited wealth and inherited home ownership and all the benefits that were bestowed to my family because of the new deal, the GI Bill, or all these other things. So there has to be the one cultural shift I could say is not necessarily, you know, how do you undo white supremacy? I think that's a lot. But there has to be a, a different form of just dealing with other people to counter the individualism that is also deeply rooted in America. And this, you know, hold on to private property you know the folks who are coming out here are like we need to defend our property so we're going to kill you for that 
that's a deeply held belief, even if it's not that, ex that extreme amongst other white Americans. It's a deeply held belief. You know, you want to have your high property values. So you isolate out to the suburbs and you have white flight. And then you have these segregated communities who then have these ongoing problems. Um, but for folks who are still grappling with that, vote for the people who support those policies. So even if you don't want to li live amongst black people, you don't want to share, at least demand that the government does it. Demand that we have baby bonds. So maybe you want to live, you know, out in the, the suburbs somewhere, but at least support black people being able to get some sort of, of help. If private citizens aren't doing it, someone, it has to come from somewhere. So support those policies if you can't personally, you know, share share in in that american dream for everyone else and what do we do when we see the police trying to kill somebody do we stand there while the knee is on the neck do we stand by while he pulls out the gun and shoots at point blank range what do, what do we do I, I think if if you've been a witness you're paralyzed certainly in that moment and of course you want to live and no one will believe you. They're always going to believe the cops. So, but, but, event, but eventually, we have to intervene. I just don't know. I don't know. I don't know what to suggest. I don't, I don't know how to give this advice. But, but um, the police, instead of us being afraid of them, they need to be afraid of us. And I don't mean afraid for their lives. Afraid enough to think, you know what? I shouldn't beat this person. I shouldn't kill this person. I should probably take my knee off their neck. How do we make that happen? I'm, I don't, I'm not asking you for the answer. I'm just saying I'm putting this out into the air here uh, because we all need to think about this and we need to act. Malika, um, I know you've got to go. You know, you're busy there with what you're doing in Kenosha. Um, thank you for taking this time with me here today on Rumble. Um, I'm so grateful that you're there. You are taking a risk just being there in a time of pandemic. Um, I hope you're staying safe. Please keep pro providing the context of what we're witnessing here. When the, when the violence died down in, um, in Portland uh, a week or so ago, so did the coverage. But the protest didn't stop. Everybody's out there every night. But unless they've got a burning building or somebody brandishing a gun, um, they just kind of tend to ignore it. So keep at it. Keep, uh, we're, we'll keep following you. I'll post links of yours. Uh, if you have a chance to go to my um, Twitter feed, I've been reading it here this week. It's very powerful. Uh, what, what's your handle on, on Twitter? And I'll put this on my podcast uh, site here too. Okay. It's at Malika Jabali. Um, oh, why did you make it so complicated? <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. It's at, yes, Mal uh, Malika. Spell Malika for people. M as a Mary, A-L-A-I-K-A-J-A-B as in boy, A-L-I. Um, and that's on Twitter. Uh, so just put the at symbol before that. And you can read some incredible um, Twitter commentary uh, as uh, she is there in Kenosha, Wisconsin right now. Thank you. Thank you for the work you've done. Thank you for what you've done for Milwaukee and all the other things. And thank you for pointing out the, the, the other viruses that we're facing in terms of capitalism and white supremacy and these things, uh, they all have to go. They have to go with COVID. They all have got to go. And uh, we'll have a better world, uh, a better country if we do that. So, like a thank you. Please be safe there, okay? Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael, for your work as well. We, we really appreciate that. And your focus on the Midwest, huh. it's necessary. Well, uh, it, it is uh, it, only in the sense that I hope most Democrats have figured out now why um, they lost Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. And, um, and to ignore the black communities in these three states is to bring about the, your ruination. So don't do that uh, this year, Democratic Party candidates, etc. cetera. Um, all right. Uh, thank you. And um, um, we're going to move on here with the show, but uh, um, we'll be thinking of you and uh, we'll be reading what you're writing. I appreciate that. Take care. Uh, take care.
I just got to take a minute here to acknowledge a new underwriter, Raycon. These are incredible little earbuds designed and invented by uh, the rapper uh, Ray J. Uh, I'm sure many of you know. A lot of these kind of premium earbuds, they cost a ton of money. And so they're either asking people that maybe don't have, you know, the working people, whatever, don't have the money for this sort of thing. And then putting out a lot of money that they don't need to be putting out on earbuds. And so he said, there's got to be a better way to do this. And so he invented a a new way to do it and charge 50% less uh, than these other premium earbuds. His newest model, it's called the Everyday E25 earbuds. And everybody that I know, at least, have tried them. They said that these are really, they are the same quality of the, the ones that you're paying twice as much money for. You get six hours of play time, you know, on, on one charge, right? And you get this, you get kind of a noise isolating effect from these. Even though they're little earbuds, they almost, they feel like you've got those, those big cans on the, the headphones that muffle out all sound. These seem to do the same thing. And of course, Ray J is, he's got a number of other people in the music business who are now using his earbuds. Everybody from Snoop Dogg to Cardi B, Melissa Etheridge, so I want to encourage you to give them a look, to thank them for supporting Rumble. And um, here's the way you, you can do that. You go to buyraycon.com slash Rumble. You get 15% off your order and you get to support them and they get to support Rumble. And I want to personally thank Raycon for supporting my voice, supporting Rumble. And that's buyraycon.com slash Rumble. 